We've got a Cleveland Junior High School that has had more than its share of problems. Bad scene there today. We'll be going live to Kent State for an updated report on the gym controversy down there. Jim Mueller tells about a lot of joy in the Browns training camp and the Browns camp it is now. And Dick will tell us how long this rain is going to be with us. News Center 8 is next. Stay with us. News Center 8 is next with those stories and a report tonight from Neil Zerker in Lake Erie with a man and his own little island. WJKW TV 8, Cleveland. Good evening, I'm Judd Hambrick. Here's what's happening. Cleveland's Addison Junior High became enveloped in still another problem today, fire. A blaze broke out backstage in the school's auditorium, filled the three-story building with smoke, forced 760 students to evacuate, and ultimately sent 32 firemen to the hospital for smoke inhalation. Addison, you might remember, was not supposed to reopen this year because of Cleveland's desegregation plan, and because the 50-year-old building was literally falling down. It cost the school board more than 100 grand to fix up Addison, and now, as a result of today's fire, it's going to cost even more. Firemen are still trying to figure out what caused the blaze, and I guess that school principal Jerry Mitchell summed up the official frustration when he told New Center 8 that, quote, we'll reopen, but it's just one more problem that we didn't need. And while firemen sift through the rubble at Addison trying to find answers, Cleveland police are trying to solve a mystery all their own. What, if anything, happened to a young woman who jumped from the Detroit Superior Bridge? Police were called to the west end of the bridge at about 9.30 this morning. They had three separate reports from witnesses who told of a woman jumping. New Center 8's Jim Fennerty was there with the first police call. But despite a search by more than a dozen officers, there was no sign of either the woman or where she might have jumped. This area is covered with weeds and brush that grow more than 10 feet high. Police think a body could be lost somewhere within it, or speculate the jumper might have gone into the Cuyahoga River. If that's the case, the mysterious woman, if she is missing, might not turn up for several days. Possible single homicide could become a double homicide. Police explain it this way. 22-year-old Valerie Bell, also known as Valerie Carmichael, who lived at this apartment house at East 56th and Kinsman, was found nude this morning alongside her bed with an electric cord around her neck. She had been dead since Saturday. The reason police are calling it a possible double homicide is because Valerie was four months pregnant. These kinds of stories are always tragic, but this young woman also had two other children. The welfare department reportedly took them away several weeks ago. Valerie also has a record of mental illness. The official coroner's ruling will not come out until tomorrow morning. Joe McCurdy owns the Chantel Carryout store on St. Clair Avenue, and today he was hopping mad, and so were all of his relatives who happened to be nearby. This morning, a man from the Internal Revenue Service showed up at his store with a moving van. The way 37-year-old McCurdy tells it, the IRS threatened to close his store down, take away his inventory, and auction off everything to make good a $7,000 debt. Back taxes, they said. Relatives, neighbors, and friends gathered throughout the morning to support McCurdy. It became loud. Police were called in. But this angered McCurdy and his friends even more because, according to them, all the police were white. We talked with the IRS this afternoon. It contends its actions were justified. Right now, though, all the inventory remains in the store, and McCurdy wants the state attorney general's office to investigate because he says he can't possibly owe that much in taxes. The first pieces of heavy construction machinery were escorted by police today onto Kent State University. Building the gym down there is on again, but there were problems. Our city camera reporter, Jeff Maynard, is down there right now at Kent State and has this live report. Jim? The prevailing feeling here on campus is that the second fight for Blanket Hill is over. That it ended early today when the construction crews moved in and began rearranging the ground where students died seven years ago. Only a few protesters were out here as the earth movers moved in. One protester stepped in front of a tractor, but just for a moment, when police told him to move, he moved. Some opponents of the gym sang a protest song, a few cried. Later in the day, about 100 protesters and a few hundred spectators gathered for a rally. Protest leaders talked of a major national rally that they hoped to call here this weekend. They marched to the university president's office, and they broke up their march there as riot-equipped university police looked on. 
There are court cases still pending in the fight for Blanket Hill. They may be pursued, but this was a fight to stop construction of a new gym. And tonight, that construction has already started. Jeff Maynard, live with the city cam at Kent State. Whether it was some symbolic protest or just a violent act of suicide, I guess we'll never know now. What we do know is that Mark Malatesta of Columbus decided to end it all on Sunday by setting himself on fire. 27-year-old man soaked himself with gasoline, walked out on his porch, lit a match, set himself on fire. Neighbors watched in horror. Firemen were called, but all they could do was hose down the body and pronounce Malatesta dead. Mayor Perk had a big crackdown on pornography shops in Cleveland 10 days ago, closed down 18 shops. But those shops were back in business faster than the blink of an X-rated neon marquee. Today, the shops are open, and according to the store managers I talked to, business is better than ever. They say Perk's anti-pornography campaign hasn't hurt the porno movie or book business one bit. However, those same managers wouldn't talk to me on camera. They said they wanted the whole porno controversy to die down a bit first before they did any talking. There's a mother in South Euclid who says that the desegregation issue is important, but she's been fighting a different kind of discrimination for a lot of years. Mike Cragen talked to that mother today, and he has a report. Mike? Judd, for eight years, Joe Perpera of South Euclid has been fighting to get her mentally retarded daughter in public school. For eight years, the South Euclid Lindhurst Board of Education has stood in the schoolhouse door and said no. Cynthia Perpara, they said, was too severely retarded. They did not have the facilities for her. Joe Perpara contended that was discrimination. Finally, under pressure from the state and under threat of federal court action, the board stepped aside. And today, Cindy Perpara, who is now 13 years old, went to school for the first time. Cindy is unable to verbalize her feelings, but you could see the excitement as the school bus pulled up in front of her house. You sensed as she ran for the bus, she knew as of today, she was more like the other kids, a little less different. Cindy's attending class at Noble Elementary in Cleveland Heights. Transportation and tuition are paid by South Euclid schools. They still don't have a program for the severely handicapped. Noble does. Noble's principal, James McKee, met Cindy out in front this morning, and he walked her inside. He told me Cindy belongs in public school, that it'll be good for her kids, and the other children, too. Uh, retardation was catchy, and uh, now when they, they now know the retarded kids, it's not catchy, and it's something that these children can um, be productive with later on in life. For Joe Perpara, the moment of victory was clouded only by the thought of all those lost years. Well, she's lost, you know, seven of her school years, that she's not been in the classroom with, peer, with her peers. I, I'm sad about that. I can't go back and recapture those seven years for Cynthia. Joe Perpara's victory is not hers alone, nor is it Cindy's alone. It's a victory for all retarded people. For as Cindy's lawyer told me, never again will a public school in the state of Ohio be able to say no to a retarded child. Judd? Now, the case of Legionnaire's disease in the news tonight. This one discovered at Ohio State University Hospital in Columbus. 22-year-old man has it. He's reported in satisfactory condition. This brings to seven, the total number found in central Ohio in about three weeks. We checked just before news time today and found that no cases as of yet have been found in the Cleveland area. Well, in addition to me, there's another new face here on News Center 8 tonight, uh, much more attractive than mine, Susan Howard. Susan's a new reporter, and today she's been out in Lakewood looking into an ordinance that has served to help keep abortion clinics from opening out there.